Hello, traders. It's Friday, January the 10th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com, here to give you a market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade. And more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in these final 24 hours of trade this ahead. We'll also spill a little bit over into next week. Now, this past session, we are still on pins and needles, even though the U.S. president and Iran's authority seems to have come to some very unusual armistice uh, suggestion, uh, despite the strong rhetoric uh, that was interpreted by many to just mean that the two countries would back down and not escalate. Uh, since we did not get an escalation through Thursday's active session, you did see some easing of fear. Now, I still think the, the, the accelerated decline in fear and the exceptional, exceptionally high level of exposure the markets have is not genuine enthusiasm or conviction about the geopolitical tensions, much less the outlook for the economy and the financial system. I think it's much more a, a troubling sign of the speculative lean of the market, leaning dangerously uh, uh, over the edge. Uh, and that can create problems, but will it? Uh, yes, it will eventually, but when? When is always the, the factor. And we'll talk about that as, long, as well as some of the key fundamental themes, and we'll look at some of the really short-term event risk and potential for a couple currencies in particular. Uh, but before we get into all of that, if you could take 10 seconds uh, with the hypothetical, uh, after you review it, we can dive right in. All right, so we start where I often start in risk. And risk is best measured by assets that have a sensitivity to risk on, risk off. My preference is US equities, uh, the indices. Uh, I think it's worth repeating why I choose this because it is a enormously flawed asset class. Uh, but the reason I choose it is because of its outperformance on a short term basis. So just since the beginning uh, or the 12 month rolling average uh, or performance, but also since the recovery from the great financial crisis, it has been the champion, the leading uh, uh, the leading asset uh, that I follow or asset type that I follow. Uh, and of course, U.S. equities is a uh, leader for global equities and its largest economy. Also has a monetary policy time frame that worked very much in its favor, both in terms of accommodation and then for tightening at the proper time and accommodating again. Uh, it's also, as I suggested before, not at all a great representation of genuine risk on risk off. Uh, and that's because the backdrop of risk on risk off is wildly different than what you see from something like the S&P 500, but it's also wildly different than most other risk assets. It's a general uh, sense in this, the speculative uh, space that investors are really comfortable going long risk. And it's not for the yield, because the yield is terrible. Uh, this is the combination that makes my risk reward index. It's just a G10 10 year government bond yield uh, aggregated. Sure, you get higher rates of return out there, but this is the floor. This sets a consistent baseline. And FX volatility, because it's a little bit more global in nature, that's the risk. So, risk reward, or more often we reference actually reward and risk, but for some reason we call it risk reward as a ratio. So, it's not that there's a great amount of return to be had. So what does a really industrious, really speculatively comfortable market do when it wants to get exposure? It chases momentum. It chases whatever is offering capital gains by high sell higher or not sell at all seems to be the case nowadays. Uh, that's what is sought. Not the rates of return, not the value, but what can keep moving. And that's what we're dealing with. All right. Now, I, as I said before, it is really remarkable uh, just this past session, you can see the performance here from the S&P 500, new record high, gap higher, uh, intraday high, record high close. Eh, it checks all the boxes uh, for the technicalities of that record. And it's not unique to the, the S&P 500. That's my preferred asset just because there's a lot more trading in the derivatives of the S&P 500 as a baseline. Uh, and the NASDAQ, you get the same sense from all of them. 
All right, so it's U.S. equities that are outperforming, but it's not just a risk response from U.S. equities. Rest of world, VEU, although got the gap, it got a little bit of follow through, it's lacking some of the enthusiasm of the new record highs from the U.S. equities because uh, the new high even for the, the year or multi-year is not there, at least not yet. Emerging markets, uh, more of that reticence, high yield fixed income, more of that. Uh, this one actually has the new high on a technical basis. Not a record high, but a new high, so it does carry some of that, uh, that optimism. Carry trade obviously has been something struggling uh, for a while, and it does not uh, keep pace at all with the rest of these assets, even the the more laggard of the previously aforementioned assets. Um, but what do you get from this? You get that there is risk on, but it is certainly skewed in favor of those markets that have been pace setters. Again, let me take the moving average off here and let's look at the S&P 500, a pace setter versus rest of world equities, VEU. Ratio rises and almost a record high close on this ratio. All right, let's look at the S&P 500 relative to emerging markets, the EEM ETF, gains. All right. So what you see in this is a preference not equally distributed in risk assets, but rather really a preference for momentum. And that's a certainly risk on. But that is not really truly robust risk on. That is get your speculative bid in and take advantage of uh, the momentum while you can. All right. That's not deep conviction. That's opportunism. Now. A lot of people would say, who cares? What's the difference? Uh, the difference is it's easier to knock a market off pace and off course if it's purely run, run on momentum-based sentiment. If it's a deep fundamental conviction about the outlook, completely different story. Uh, it can uh, fend off numerous events. And you'll look at this and you'll say, well, uh, we've had... Trade wars, first half of 2019, still continued higher. Uh, we had uh, new issues with growth concerns, still building, actually. Uh, it's not throwing us off. We've had geopolitical tensions. It's not throwing us off. True, very true. Uh, but how comfortable are you on believing that the market is completely divorcing itself from a sense of value and is completely fine with building up exposure at a higher cost a record cost in this case, uh, with no concern that it will fall against fundamental winds. Depends on your risk tolerance. My risk tolerance is nowhere near that high. So I will not be blindly convinced that this can continue without question. All right. So risk trends and the pricing of risk through something like the the volatility index, the VIX. You can do this through a lot of um, volatility measures. This is the Euro VIX. Ignore that uh, incredibly distorted candle. Uh, their their data is not particularly good. Uh, but the Euro VIX from the CME, the pound yen VIX as well. You have the oil volatility index, which is incredibly uh, low, despite the circumstances that we've been talking about this, uh, this past week. Um, yeah, it's risen, but it just really does not reflect, reflect what's out in the open market. And uh, the volatility of emerging markets, a very trade war exposed risk-based measurement, and it too is extremely low. Low across the board, speculative exposure, high across the board. So it, sh it needs to be said, this is pricing in perfection. Not absolute perfection, but this is pricing in no worries. And there are plenty of worries, not even worries of interpretation, just outright concerns that I think pretty much everyone would agree to. So what are those outright concerns? Well, obviously, the situation between the United States and Iran uh, is and remains a hot topic. Uh, now, this is crude oil, one of the better measurements of this. Why? Well, Actually, at this point, both Iran and the United States are great uh, or are large exporters of oil, remarkably, uh, large producers of oil. Uh, but it still carries over the expectation that there is a supply demand influence, um, obviously not just directly to the United States, but the rest of the world. 
uh, Iran has a history of uh, influencing the supply chain uh, to uh, leverage oil prices higher and subsequently uh, render pressure on the rest of the world, especially when economic sanctions are applied. The United States has not retaliated for Iran's uh, uh, missile attack on, an, on a U.S. airbase in Iraq. And that was in retaliation uh, uh, for the pre last Thursday uh, unexpected attack by the United States, a drone attack on a convoy that uh, saw one of Iran's top generals killed. So obviously the tensions have been building sharply, um, including the uh, the protests at the uh, the uh, embassy in Iraq, and uh, of course we always uh, you go back to the economic sanctions that the United States has placed on on Iran and the reversal of its nuclear treaty um, backing out, uh, but definitely on a course higher. We're at a pause. Uh, there's nothing to say that this is going to last. And yet the markets take it on confidence that it, since it's not been talked about today, it must be behind us because you saw how we've positioned for risk. And you also see that we are lower for oil prices. Quite remarkable. And really, it's not a, it's, this is not a sense of the situation between the United States and Iran. If we were just looking at it as price reflection of the concern around these, the uh, environment, it would be a slow build with a pronounced increase and plateau. But instead, this is a reflection of speculative appetite and how it uh, the conviction can revert uh, to just expectations of complacency and stability, even though there is good reason to believe not. Can this suddenly revive fear, pull back S&P 500, bolster the VIX? Yes, yes it can, absolutely. With little warning, and that's the, that's the problem. But as of right now, the markets are pricing in no concern, or little concern, it's not fair to say no concern. So keep tabs on this. This just means you have to watch the headlines. Uh, and it is a burden, this is where the channel of time frame or timeline um, and the impact that it can carry are so uh, so ambiguous and so severe, respectively, that this is genuinely the uh, the height of risk, and we still aren't pricing in much for it. All right. Again, this this can be ignored, but it also translates into a. Uh, a distorted distribution of potential. If you continue to rise, you're doing so under the guise of uncertainty. And yeah, it can go up, and it has been going up, but it's probably going to be slow choppy. But if it goes down, again, motivated by one of these risks, including geopolitical tensions, it's more likely to drop sharply because of the exposure that the market has and the lack of balance in uh, hedging exposure. Now, other fundamental themes. You can't just get locked up on uh, on a wait and see for non uh, for uh, the uh, U.S. Iran tensions. Uh, we still have growth to consider. Uh, here's the 10-year, two-year yield spread. All right, still doing fairly well as I showed you before, though. Um, you can't take that on on faith. Uh, the 10-year, two-year spread uh, has a history of, uh, of normalizing. And that's when act, economic activity starts to drop. This is the service sector PMI, which is a, a, for the United States, uh, the critical measure of economic output. Uh, so it actually happens sometime after the inversion. And we are after the inversion uh, time frame from, by about five months. So when I can run the statistics for you, but really there's only two instances. So it's not really reliable. I would not rely on it. So I don't do it. But in the meantime, you have uh, surveys coming out. Um, I mentioned the World Bank. All right, the World Bank's uh, economic update. Um, you can see that uh, their forecast for 2020 for the world declined by 0.2%. The United States by 0.1%. Emerging markets 0.5%. Uh, you're looking at, uh, let's see. Area. Euro area actually upticking 0.1%, although one of the slower paces at a 1.8% growth. Japan really struggling. Um, but 
very poor outlook potential uh, returns follow growth and there's nothing there of substance and i'd remind that we also had the conference board ceo recently a ceo survey it ticked up it bounced up from the lowest level since the great financial crisis but it's still below uh, a, a balance of optimists so they're still mostly pessimists and deloitte um, actually released a survey of CFOs who remarkably said 97% of the, the people that they surveyed believe that the economic downturn was already occurring or would at least by the end of the year. So going back to what I had here, what will ultimately send the market into its eventual inevitable bearish reversal, regardless of when it happens, regardless of the time frame. And actually, after some changes uh, from the last time I updated, this is the final vote, 196, 31% say it's recession fears. Take this one seriously. Definitely take this one seriously. All right. Trade. Trade wars is also a consideration, although it's probably for next week. Trump said uh, in a tweet that uh, they would start work immediately on phase two of the uh, negotiations. Remember, we're expected to uh, sign the phase one trade deal with uh, between the United States and China on Wednesday. Um, if that date is missed, the markets will be very concerned. Dollar yuan, which you're looking at here, will probably shoot higher, and Aussie USD will accelerate lower. They'll probably also have a risk impact, although you can never tell with this market. Um, but the timing of the phase two, which is really the serious uh, part uh, of the deal to, to roll back the economic negative economic impact that it's been having. Uh, and, you know, uh, yet another insight on that. It was uh, the Minneapolis Fed President Kashkari who suggested that there's nervous, nervousness caused by tariffs and leading to low business investment. Um, it, there's a lot of this. There's data and there are uh, their assessments uh, ad nauseum. Um, but if it's not going to be market moving now, then it's something we need to put at the back burner. I'm paying attention to it because if it does suddenly show up, it will be a huge market mover. But until it does, don't anticipate that it's going to drive you know, immediate momentum. But if you're a position trader, long-term trader, totally different uh, situation. Price for the long term. Uh, now, in terms of monetary policy, also uh, something that's in the backdrop, it's not particularly market moving, although uh, we had a ton of Fed speakers this past session, um, and uh, a lot of what they were saying was uh, ultimately lacking for uh, convincing conviction. One of the uh, the highlights that I thought was really remarkable was Fed's Clarita, who suggested that the Fed may continue to pump short uh, funds into short-term lending, uh, f uh, probably out to at least April. That is an extension um, of the current anticipation that was supposed to be ending this month or next month. Um, so that's a problem because that indicates that the, the financing market, the uh, lending market, is uh, seized up. Uh, not totally seized. Obviously, they're not getting over subscriptions, uh, but it all would take is uh, in, in some unforeseen event in the financial system to really cause problems. The other update that I thought was uh, noteworthy was from Williams, uh, who was talking about a number of things, but he spoke actually on uh, the need to be mindful uh, and and considering very carefully changes to the Fed's framework. At the next rate decision, we're supposedly going to hear any potential changes to what the Fed is targeting. A lot of talk around this, and obviously the rise of negative rates has a lot of people wondering whether monetary policy is even effective uh, and what can work in the future, especially if we uh, come across a new financial problem, a new economic problem. Now, if you're looking for short-term volatility and not trying to find, uh, wait for geopolitical tensions to escalate or look for the long term for trade wars or uh, growth concerns uh, to reestablish, then I would look to the economic docket. There are a few things that I think are very high uh, level, high worthy uh, market movement. There's a couple of Aussie based indicators and some China data that could potentially be a mover for the Australian dollar. I do like actually a number of these Aussie crosses, uh, but uh, I'm not putting my expectations too high. The dollar and the Canadian dollar on the hand might be a different story. So maybe rounding out the, the Mexican peso. So we start with the Mexican peso, it's the lowest. There's consumer confidence and there's uh, activity in the industrial production. So 
manufacturing, which is a more important element of uh, Mexican economy. Uh, the really tight congestion here, I think, has great break potential. But remember what the bigger picture is: one week dollar peso. That's a you're breaking a huge triangle, huge wedge. It's actually one of my top trades. Um, so it's taking its time playing out. It needs a, a clear catalyst, but in the meantime, the potency is is there. It just needs to be sparked. The dollar has non-farm payrolls. So we're going to non-farm payrolls Friday. Dollar has had a nice rebound. We've cleared that short-term range high that I showed in the four-hour chart, clearing up to a not really a confirmed descending trend channel top, uh, but it will act as some kind of technical milestone for many. There's also a little bit of confluence in the general 9750 area for this index. Euro USD has um, some mild support that you could say 105, 111. Um, you can also look at something like the pound dollar, similar kind of situation, dollar yen has some resistance. Uh, lots of uh, proximate technical boundary for the dollar for upside continuation. Non-farm payrolls can help spur it. It can be a, a break to the upside. But remember, breaks to the upside with follow-through intent on an employment data that's already a very strong positive uh, trend, it's going to be difficult to really reinforce. Also, the ADP figure earlier this week, although I, I'm not a really big fan of it as a proxy for the official government figures, was stronger, uh, significantly stronger than expectations, and it's leading expectations uh, in turn for the buildup of the long dollar. So yes, uh, strong non-farm payrolls can uh, offer some lift here, but how much more employment improvement is going to uh, bolster the growth forecast or bolster the Fed's potential rate hikes? Not much. Alternatively, if it disappoints, you're at resistance. You have a bullish leaning dollar already from the perspective of growth and perspective of monetary policy. And naturally, just a move back into range for many of this, for many of these pairs. That is a path least resistance. That's a probably more uh, productive outcome. I'm not saying it's a higher probability. I just think the market would respond more readily to that outcome. So consider that. Now the Canadian dollar has a history, a tendency of being much more responsive to it in a, a, a severe way, uh, responsive to its employment statistics. Now, of course, it's, it's, its employment data has to impress or disappoint significantly to actually render a relatively strong movement in the Canadian dollar. But as I said, historically, there is bigger movement from the Canadian dollar, and it's very short term. It doesn't uh, recently hasn't been providing a lot of trend or follow through, but volatility is definitely good for it. Dollar cat obviously is at the focus of two key events coming at exactly the same time. Watch this one for volatility, but be very cautious if you intend to trade it. Wait until after the data hits the wire, certainly. Uh, but there are some other Canadian dollar crosses, CAD yen, look where you're at in that technical pattern, or uh, Aussie CAD, uh, which we looked at earlier. It's at the bottom of a general, although not very clean, range. Of course, you have the likes of uh, the pound Aussie or the euro Aussie, which are interesting in their own technical right, uh, but uh, I'm keeping it closer to the, the normals, uh, sorry, the normal pairs. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of the markets and with a more progressive outlook for the high-level event risk next week, uh, tomorrow. Until then, I wish you all good luck trading out there.